I have an article that will be up on the Counterpunch website either tomorrow or Thursday, probably, about the campaign finance section of HR1, which is an omnibus uh, voting reform bill, has three sections, one on voting, a lot of good measures in there, make it easier to vote, uh, make it harder to prevent people from voting, and it's got an ethics section, which has some good things like requiring presidential candidates to disclose their tax returns. But it buried in the middle of it is a campaign finance reform that I say is a reform that doesn't reform. One thing it does is increase by five times the amount of money you've got to raise to qualify, which puts it beyond the reach of third parties like the Green Party. Now, under the current public funding of presidential campaigns, the presidential primary matching funds, you have to raise $5,000 in 20 states in contributions of $250 or less. And our campaign was the only campaign that uh, qualified and applied for those funds. The major party candidates don't apply these days because if you accept public money, there's a cap on how much private money you can spend, which this year was about $52 million. And for the major party candidates, that's not enough. The cost of campaigning has just gone up through the roof so much that they haven't been taking it in recent elections. <clears throat> so that's one problem. It basically excludes third parties. And then it provides a six to one match for the money you do raise. Now it's a one to one match, which may sound good. But when you think about it, what that does is increase the disparity between candidates sevenfold. So if you're, suppose the Green Party barely qualifies at $500,000, but uh, a small major party candidate like Marianne Williamson or Julian Castro, they raised about $5 million in small contributions. So multiply both of those qualified amounts of funds by six times. So the Green would get uh, $350,000 or $3.5 million. And, you know, a candidate like Julian Castro would get $45 million. So the disparity increases from $4.5 million to $31.5 million, which is a sevenfold increase. So that's another problem with it. It also increases the amount that national party committees can contribute to presidential campaigns. Now it's $5,000. Each national party has three national committees, the national committee itself and their Senate and House campaign committees. That increases from $5,000 under this HR1 proposal to $100 million. And what that does is open more opportunities for big donors because while you're limited to $5,600, 2,800 for the primary, 2,800 for the general, to the candidates committee, you can give over 109,000 to the national committees in 2020. So if you gave to all three, it'd be about $330,000. So that's, that's big donor money. And then there's more problems as a result of decisions like Citizens United and McCutcheon in 2014, they have victory funds now that are joint uh, committees of the candidate committee for president, the national committee, and state party committees. So rich folks could give over $620,000 to Biden's victory fund. Trump's was a little under 500,000. Depends on how many state parties participated. Now, you know, the little people can't participate in that, but it's just more opportunity. And then, of course, you've got unlimited contributions. People can make the super PACs and dark money that's laundered through 501c4 nonprofits and passed on to super PACs. And those are so-called independent expenditures, but everybody sort of winks at that, knowing that these super PACs are usually set up by former campaign staffers, and they don't need to be directly instructed to know what the message needs to be put out there. So... The, the campaign finance reform 
in uh, HR1 basically adds a little bit of public money on top of this exploding volcano of private money. And so that's why I call it a reform that doesn't reform.